Hi everyone, Nathan here from TickBoom. Uh, you're probably used to seeing these hairy hands working through math questions in my grid book. Uh, but today I'm going to do something a little different. You get to enjoy my hairy face as I take a look through the recently uh, released joint statement on proposed changes to the math curriculum in Australia. So they titled it Why Maths Must Change and I think they mean why the math curriculum must change because I don't think math itself is changing too much. I think Pythagoras' theorem is still Pythagoras' theorem, but basically why the way we teach math must change, I think, is, is really what they mean. And as someone who's training to be a math teacher, the reality is by the time I hit the classrooms, any of these proposed changes would probably have been implemented or at least started to be implemented. So this will affect um, what I'm going to be teaching in the classroom. So I thought you may be interested to hear my perspectives on, on what what um, argument is being put forth. So I'll kind of have a read through and, and just share my commentary as I read through. And then um, I'd encourage if you um, agree or disagree with, with any of the points I make, please feel free to share it in the comments. Um, I think it will be helpful to have a bit of a healthy debate on this. Um, because whilst I agree with a lot of this statement, um, there's some things I don't agree with. So. Let me just start reading through and I'll just pause and, and share some of my reflections. So um, the statement starts off by saying, at the end of this month, proposed revisions to the Australian math curriculum will be released for public consultation. We cannot underestimate the value of this revised math curriculum and the importance of getting it right. Curriculum reviews and updates are challenging tasks. What must be forefront in the minds of those crafting the document is the learners and the society those learners will ultimately serve. Okay, nothing too controversial there. Uh, more than ever, our society needs students who are adaptable, resilient, responsive to challenges and able to handle unfamiliar situations. It is not enough to have knowledge, they must have the skills to take that knowledge and apply it to solve unknown problems and do it quickly. Okay, so I'd say I agree with most of that paragraph, but that final throwaway line of and do it quickly, I don't know if I fully agree with that. And the reason I say that is because um, when I was working as a financial modeler, um, it was quite common that there'd be this desire to build your financial models really quickly. So in building financial models, ultimately what we're doing is we're solving problems, which is definitely kind of under, under the umbrella of this wanting students to learn how to problem solve. I mean, that is the life of a financial modeler, solving problems, mostly in the context of business. But this whole, and do it quickly, it just never, I never experienced that as being the most critical factor in being a successful financial modeler. And that's not to say you are deliberately slow, like you don't dawdle about what you're doing. But actually, I have found that um, in that area of mathematical work, um, following the old carpenter's adage of measure twice, cut once, you know, that, uh, that, or, or putting it as slow and steady wins the race, that kind of mentality actually would lead to more success than just trying to rush and get things done quickly. So um, the reason for that, at least in that context, is because when you make a mistake in building a financial model, the amount of time it would take to find that error and undo it and fix it, the amount of time to do that would far outweigh any gains you might have made up front by trying to go really fast. So often um, when I'd be teaching people how to build financial models, I would be saying a lot of the discipline that you're learning, a lot of the techniques you're learning, they're actually forcing you to slow down. They're forcing you to avoid making mistakes in the first place so that you don't waste all your time trying to fix them. And so that kind of whole and do it quickly, I'm, ju I'm just not sure whether I fully agree with that and, and what that's about. Um, in, in kind of the practical day-to-day -day work that I was doing, being really fast wasn't, wasn't that important. Now, I kind of get that for students in, in school, most mathematics kind of gets reduced to doing well on tests. And because these tests are always timed, you can kind of see how it's not a huge logical leap to say you need to be fast at this. You know, um, if you're not fast enough, you run out of time. If you run out of time, you won't get the marks. If you don't get the marks, 
then we don't think you're very good. And I don't think that's true at all um, in terms of testing. Um, but uh, I can kind of see how logically you get to the conclusion that you need to be able to do this stuff quickly. Um, so that's probably the first point in this statement where I'd say I don't necessarily agree. But anyway, let's keep reading. So the statement continues, the pandemic in particular has shown us the value of this. Um, the value of this. I, I guess they, they're referring to the problem skill of problem solving and thinking mathematically, and I'd agree. The pandemic actually has been a really good example of where understanding mathematical concepts in, in the broad population, so not just professionals understanding math, but everybody, um, has really been shown to be important. Like understanding a concept like let's um, flatten the curve. You know, that's a very mathematical idea. Even just the idea of exponential growth, the idea that the infectiousness of um, the um, uh, disease, like the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the, the COVID-19, the disease, just comprehending that, that that's going to lead to exponential growth, like understanding that mathematical idea could um, be critical to then deciding, do I take this seriously or not? Um, so yeah, I'd agree. The pandemic has shown us the value of being able to understand things mathematically. Um, all right, so the statement goes on. We need education systems and curricula that help deliver students to society who are up for such a challenge. Just having knowledge is no longer enough. Instead, the abilities to problem solve, mathematize, hypothesize, model, are all skills that add worth to acquired knowledge. Mathematics learning cannot sit in silos that focus on content and procedures. Instead, it must be something that gives the knowledge purpose. I 100% agree with that. Um, in the time I've been spending teaching lately, um, tutoring and, and whatnot, one of the most common questions I've been getting, and I think it's a very common question for all math teachers, is when will I ever use this? You know, um, students really have a desire to connect the math that they learn to, to kind of what they're going to use it for. And so that whole idea of giving the knowledge purpose and kind of teaching it in a, a, a realistic context, I think is, is spot on. And so if there's changes to the curriculum that lead to that, I think they would be good. Um, so continuing on, the statement goes on to say, as such, the suggested revisions in the curriculum are not just welcome, they are necessary if we are to maintain our position as a leader on the world stage in fields such as mathematics, science, engineering, and finance, okay? Uh, don't know if, I don't really know what maintaining our position as a leader on the world stage means. Maybe they mean, you know, there's more Australians kind of making it to the very top of these fields. And so therefore those are leaders, I'm not sure, but you know, it sounds like a fine aspiration, whatever it means. Um, the next paragraph says, the outcomes of recent reputable global assessments have been a reminder that our students are owed a curriculum that aims high. According to the PISA results, we have fallen behind by 14 months of schooling since 2003. All right, interesting. So. Um, in case you're not aware, PISA is kind of like an international version of NAPLAN. If you're familiar with NAPLAN, that kind of national standardized testing that students undertake. Um, PISA is just an international version of that. Now, I wonder whether linking this argument of why we need to teach math better to results on PISA, I don't know if that is the most compelling thing to do. I think I suspect why they've done it, because I think to kind of the general population and even the political leadership in our country, um, something concrete like results on the standardized test are easy to kind of observe and um, comprehend, I guess. And so um, it might be just a bit of a strategy on behalf of the people who wrote this statement to try and um, kind of just link it to something that people will get. But if you really take the time to think about what a PISA result really tells us, I don't know if it's that convincing that we should necessarily link our desire for better math to better results on PISA. So first of all, I don't even know what falling behind by 14 months of schooling means. Is that, who are we falling behind? Is it behind the country that performs the best? Is it behind 
some average um, or some measure of center. I mean, it's not clear, but even, even setting that to the side, I just don't know what do we learn when we get results from a test on PISA. First of all, who does the PISA test? Um, not everyone. Not every student does it every year. Um, instead, they kind of take a statistical approach. They look for a, a representative sample. And um, that, by definition, then, you, you're kind of picking certain schools and certain um, cohorts. And I think even over time, it's not run every year. It's run every three or four years. So straight away, you could start to question, have the methodologies that have been used to get a representative sample actually worked? Have you got a representative sample or not? Um, but even, even if you have, let's just assume they do get a representative sample. How do we know that the students taking this test are actually revealing to us their true mathematical ability? And what I mean by that is, um, PISA, NAPLAN, a lot of these standardized tests, at least in Australia, they're low states. They don't actually have an impact on anything. Like, um, teachers aren't necessarily preparing their students to take PISA to do well. Um, um, it's not, I, I don't think these PISA results end up on a student's report card that gets shown to their, their parents. Um, they certainly don't have any impact on the ability of a student to make it into university, which I think for many students, rightly or wrongly, is the main aim of doing well at high school to get into uni. So PISA is not going to affect your ATAR. So just I kind of picture a student going in and sitting the PISA test. I kind of visualize it kind of like what I used to do when I'd sit something like the mathematics competition, you know? You kind of give it a fair crack because it might be nice to do well and get a high distinction certificate or whatever. But at the end of the day, you're not really going to try that hard, are you? If if the question's particularly hard, are you really going to drain your brain on it or just move on? And um, if it's a low stakes test, I just wonder, are the, the students really giving it their best and trying that hard? And uh, a, a more important question is, is the effort, is the um, importance placed on this test the same across the world? Or do we see that those countries that end up with the best results just happen to be those countries that make PISA high stakes, you know? Um, I don't know. I actually don't know, but I think it's a question that is important. And I actually raised this question with my um, math curriculum tutor yesterday. She, she had asked if anyone had seen this statement and, and we started having a discussion about it in class. And I raised this question. I'm like, how do we know this is actually telling us the full ability of, of the students? And, and she agreed, we don't really. And she actually suggested, um, why not make that a, a bit of a research topic? And I probably will. So I'll probably follow up on this video. I'll, I'll do a bit more investigation about what the deal really is with PISA, because I just don't know if like, are we gonna are we gonna change what we do in a curriculum just because of results on a test where we don't even know if those results are valid? I mean, it doesn't sound like the smartest idea. Um, even going beyond that, it, let's just say the students are trying. Let's just say I do my research and find out, yeah, this is the best the kids can do. The next problem with tests like this is they're not testing the full the full suite of mathematical skills. Uh, the problem with tests, at least in the way they're, they're currently delivered, is you only end up testing what can be tested in that format. Um, and what I mean by that is a lot of, a lot of true mathematical skill um, isn't necessarily your ability to remember a formula or a procedure and then take, um, you know, uh, assumptions that are, are kind of spoon fed to you and then pump them through that formula. And that is largely what is tested on these kinds of tests. Whereas I'd, I'd be much more interested to see a student's ability to get up in front of a whiteboard, say, and explain to me uh, their method of working through a problem and having a dialogue. And I want to see how they explain it to me and how they adapt when I adapt the question. So if, if I give them a question, they start working through it. And then I say, okay, now what if... What if I change this? What would you do? I think that that would be uh, a much better reflection of a student's ability. Um, 
The reality is also when you write a question for a test, by definition, that question has an answer. Um, by definition. Um, and, and I think that already makes these tests a little bit unrealistic because often, again, working in mathematical areas, most of our time is spent on problems where we don't know if there's a solution. I think professional mathematicians only spend their time on problems that haven't been solved. And a lot of those problems, step one is going, is there a solution? And when I was a financial modeler, it was similar. Often step one to working on a financial model is saying, can this problem that we're trying to think about actually be solved? And if not, can we solve a similar problem that if we can work out that solution, can we then kind of draw some conclusions about the true problem? So having skills to work, actually work out, is there a solution at all? I think is important mathematically, but not even gonna get touched on a test because by definition, all questions on the test have an answer. So. I just don't know whether um, a, a student's uh, um, performance on a test is the full measure of their mathematical ability. And therefore, do we want to go reinventing curriculums and changing the way we teach just so that we can get outcomes on the test? It seems a little bit like the tail wagging the dog. Um, but anyway, those are my thoughts on um, referencing PISA. I'm just not sure... I think a lot of the arguments the being made in this statement are valid and they're valid not so that we can do well on some standardized tests, but they're valid because um, I guess thriving in day-to-day -day life requires some level of mathematical um, literacy. Um, so anyway, let's keep reading on. Uh, the statement continues to say, adjusting the focus of a curriculum so that it emphasizes these types of competencies is an authentic approach to the curriculum review. Focusing on these skills as well as knowledge and content will have a positive impact on young people's experiences of learning mathematics, and it will have a direct impact on results like PISA. Probably, I mean, that's fair enough. Again, I need to investigate, but are the questions on PISA actually problem solving questions anyway? Because um, if they're all just the same old standard question of, you know, here's, here's a question, work out what formula to use and spit out the formula. If those are the questions that are on PISA, then why does learning problem solving necessarily matter? Um, but I, I think I do agree with the argument that actually if students get better at problem solving, then even if the questions on the test aren't problem solving, chances are the students will be better at answering those questions anyway, because the problem solving is a higher um, ability. So yeah, I'd, I'd say I'd agree with that paragraph. Um, Next, uh, we read, but it is not enough to just change the curriculum. We must ensure that there is an ongoing commitment from all stakeholders to deliver effective professional development that gives our teachers the skills to teach not just the content, but the skills and competencies necessary. Yeah, can't, can't fault that. A focus on skill acquisition and proficiency development must be key drivers to a curriculum review in mathematics. Content should be adjusted according to this, okay? In doing so, we equip our young people and our nation of tomorrow with the skills to be able to handle the next challenge that comes our way as a society, because rest assured, there will be one. Okay, so, you know, I'd say the, the underlying sentiment of that statement is fair enough. Um, trying to link the argument to getting better outcomes on PISA is probably the main area where I disagree. But um, again, I'm not even gonna put forth that everything I think is right on this. Um, it's just one perspective. But I'd be very interested to hear some thoughts from others about whether actually PISA should be the be all and end all of um, you know, what we try and do in the math curriculum. Uh, we see here the, the various organizations that um, uh, have put together this statement. So if you're not familiar with these um, acronyms, uh, helpfully they're all kind of fleshed out in the next page. So you've got the Australian Association of Mathematics Teachers, an organization or body that I'll be joining as a math teacher. You've got ATSIMA, the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Mathematics Alliance, who do really good stuff. I've already encountered their work um, in my studies. You've got the Mathematics Education Research Group of Australasia, the Australian Academy of Science, the Australian Mathematical Sciences Institute. So all reputable bodies, so worth listening to. Um, 
and again, I'm not going to I'm not going to say that what I've what, what what my perspectives are necessarily trump what their perspectives are, but um, you know, always good to have some healthy debate. So hopefully, you found my thoughts there um, at least somewhat thought provoking. Um, uh, please feel free to, to share your your thoughts in the comments. Um, it'll be really interesting to see uh, what what other people think about this. So uh, thanks for listening and uh, tick boom.